This game is for the national championship. Michigan Ohio State is the greatest rivalry in all sports. He said in a real loud voice, he said, this is not a game, this is war. It is a 365 day obsession for the rest of their lives. my first Army Navy game was I was more nervous for that game than any game I've ever played in, whether it was a Super Bowl or a playoff game. It's not your arm or your leg or your life or your wife or anything like that. It's much more important. been talk about beating Notre Dame since day one. Almost every single day I walk off practice, somebody always tells me, make sure you do two things for me. You graduate and you beat Notre Dame. That's why millions of people want to watch this game, because it's supposed to be close, it's supposed to be bitterly fought, it's supposed to be played with great sportsmanship, and Notre Dame's supposed to win. They call it football's finest hour, Notre Dame and USC. It is a rivalry based on football excellence, a matchup that has featured over 300 All-Americans, 11 Heisman Trophy winners, 10 national championship teams, and more legendary performances than any other spectacle in college athletics. It started in the 20s. The story goes that Mrs. Newt Rockney wanted to shop in Los Angeles. That makes a good story. So USC and Notre Dame said, let's get together. So Newt Rockney and Coach Howard Jones of USC started a rivalry which is surpassed by none. 1926, the game was on. Rockney's Irish won the first one on a last minute scoring drive, 13 to 12, setting the tone for the most storied rivalry in all of sports. They had a pretty good crowd on hand for next year's game, an estimated 123,000 fans packing Soldier Field in Chicago to see Notre Dame outmatch an unbeaten USC team 7-6. to six. It is still the largest crowd ever to watch a college football game. The game was just as big as the legends who made it. We're gonna win. They can't lick it and fight, 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 fight. What do you say, man? Okay. <laughs> Rockney threw everything he had at Jones in 1930, bringing home a 27 to nothing win and a national championship. It was to be Rockney's last game. The following spring, he died in a plane crash. But the rivalry continued as Coach Jones's team won the national championship the following year with a thrilling last-second victory over the Irish. Coaches are all on Twitter. They rise to watch the play. The ball comes back. Moeller sets it up, and Faker kicks it, and it's good. It's over into the promised land. And a victory for Southern California, 16-14. to After the game, Jones took his team to visit Rockney's grave to honor his friend and rival. USC, Notre Dame. Think of the players who have played in this rivalry for Notre Dame. Johnny Lujak, Paul Horney, and Tim Brown. And for USC, 
Mike Garrett, Marcus Allen, and Charles White. And think of the teams that won national titles. Oh, just think of it. You can make a Hollywood movie out of it. Take the 1964 game. Notre Dame under Ara Parsegian in his first year. Number one in the country led 17 to nothing. Though the Trojans were down by more than two touchdowns at halftime, their coach John McKay wasn't worried. He had a strategy. People asked, what did Coach McKay say at halftime? He walked in and he said, you know, boys, if you don't score more than 17 points in the second half, you're going to get beat. We had two math majors in the back and they went, yeah, yeah. And so we just took him at his word and we went out there and sure enough took the opening kickoff in the second half, drove down and scored. With less than two minutes to play, McKay's Trojans cut the lead to 17-13. Deep in Irish territory, USC had one last chance to pull off the upset. Fourth and eight. Burdick with the snap. He's rolling. He throws. Complete to Sherman. A touchdown for USC. It was a great moment, and I'll never forget that the sound of that stadium lifted you. When the people got up and cheered, it just lifted me off the field. And uh, it was like walking on sound. Notre Dame made up for the loss in 1966, embarrassing the Trojans 51 to nothing on the way to the national championship. But Anthony Davis would make them pay in 1972, running wild for six touchdowns in what remains the single greatest performance in the series history. SC ran away with a 45-23 win and their own national championship. Trojan revenge would continue in 74, but it didn't look that way at first as Notre Dame jumped to a 24 to nothing first half lead. Once again, it was up to Coach McKay to provide the halftime inspiration. He took one puff off the cigarette, puffed it, blew smoke off to the right or left, whatever. He looked up and says, uh, okay, in the second half, they're going to kick the ball off the AD, and he's going to bring it all the way back. All right, McLaughlin advances on the football. It's been an Irish afternoon as he boots it high and long and deep. In the end zone, Davis coming out at the 10. 15, 20, coming outside at the 30. He's at the 35, the 40. He's going all the way at the 30. The 25, 20, they won't catch him. Touchdown, USA! In what became the most memorable 15 minutes in the history of USC football, the Trojans scored 55 straight points over the best defense in the country. The departure of McKay and Notre Dame's Ara Parsegian ushered in a new era in Irish Trojan battles and a few new wrinkles in the series lore. In 1977, Notre Dame, led by quarterback Joe Montana, pulled a surprise on USC. They went back in the locker room and came out in green jerseys and the place went crazy for about five minutes and they proceeded to uh, hammer us pretty good. People tend to remember the green jersey as being the the reason they won, but that was a national championship team that, that wore those green jerseys. Each fall, this rivalry continues. New legends are born. Old traditions renewed. The men of Troy and the fighting Irish, all part of college football's finest hour. It's very simple. Michigan-Ohio State is the greatest rivalry in all sports, professionally or collegiately. It is something that every football fan should see before he checks out. When Ohio State plays Michigan on those Saturdays in late November, nothing else matters to the citizens of these two states. What heightens the importance of these games even more is the fact that they usually determine the Big Ten Championship 
and the right to go to the Rose Bowl. The late Bob Eufer, Michigan's legendary sportscaster, recalls a classic game. Remember 1969? That was the year of the impossible dream. In that ball game, Ohio looked just as good as their press clippings. Michigan forced Ohio State to punt from deep in Buckeye territory. Sends the ball, booted one. I can see it yet coming down here on the 38-yard line. Little Barry Pearson took it in his arm. He got a block from Tommy Darden at the 40. He picked up another one from Pete Newell at the 50. He ran away from Selena at the 40, the 30, the 25. He went down that mod side like a penguin with a hot herring in his cummerbund all the way down to 10-5. And he was piggyback ridden into the Ohio State three-yard line. And then Michigan and leading in the ball game 14 to 12 quickly broke out of the huddle with the ends in tight in the balance line the full husky in the back here don moorhead this time faked to garvey Craw, kept it himself moved in behind all american danny deardorff's block up front slid it into the buckeye end zone frank titus made the extra point and michigan had a commanding 21 to 12 lead in the second half with less than 30 seconds remaining when tommy darden intercepted masajowski's pass on the michigan 18 yard line and brought it out to the wolverine 31 yard line and michigan was still ahead 24 to 12 with 21 seconds remaining it was a foregone conclusion that Michigan had just perpetrated one of the biggest upsets in the hundred year history of man's inhumanity to man. One of the great traditions at Ohio State is Senior Tackle Day. During the team's last practice before the Michigan game, senior players get to make one last tackle before going out to play the Wolverines. All the seniors will get up and, and they'll take one last hit uh, on the dummy before going out uh, to play Michigan. It's a great time and it's a great tradition and it's lived for a long, long time and it will continue. This rivalry featured two coaching legends whose names are synonymous with this big game. Bo Schembechler of Michigan and Ohio State's Woody Hayes. I tell you, he was tough. Michigan week was totally a different week. Uh, there's no question about it. The whole atmosphere uh, was different. Uh, our fight song was played in the locker room all week long. Uh, he would have former players come in and talk uh, with us uh, about the Michigan game in particular. I remember the first uh, Michigan game my freshman year. Uh, he had Dave Whitfield uh, come in and talk uh, to the team about the Michigan game. And I remember him giving a very, very emotional, inspired uh, talk uh, to the team about uh, the Michigan game. And at the end of his, his, his speech, he said in a real loud voice, he said, this is not a game, this is war. And I looked around the, the room and I looked at some of my teammates and I saw tears coming down their eyes and you know, I just kept looking around and said, what have I gotten myself into? I mean, this, I mean, this was serious. If ever there were a time when the security of the most powerful nation on earth might possibly be in jeopardy, that time would be the fourth quarter of the Army-Navy game. The Military Academy at West Point and the Naval Academy at Annapolis have produced some of the country's greatest military leaders. Many got their first taste of competition on the football field. For them, there was no greater quest for honor and glory than a victory in the Army-Navy game. When I got to the academy, uh, you know, after my haircut, after I was shaved, uh, it was beat Army, you know, it was, uh, it was drilled into us, and uh, it was a very big part of the Naval Academy. Actually, my first Army-Navy game was, I was more nervous for that game than any game I've ever played in, whether it was a Super Bowl or a playoff game. Uh, just because of the tradition and the uh, the feeling towards that particular game by the midshipmen. A third or a half of the Corps of Cadets would come and and be there 
at a, at practice in the in the cold, the flinty, steel gray light of the West Point uh, early winter uh, out there. And so there was a feeling throughout the season that you had a responsibility to do your best, not just because of you know kind of a loyalty to your teammates, but because the Corps of Cadets was counting on you, and you didn't want to let them down. It was very powerful. Since the first Navy win back in 1890, many players have gone on to serve their country and become an indelible part of history. The student manager for the 1903 Army team was a cadet named Douglas MacArthur. Admiral John Bay Brown helped Navy beat Army in 1912. Dwight Eisenhower and Omar Bradley played for the West Pointers back in 1915. The 1935 Navy team lost 13 of its members in World War II. The year 1941 brought on the era of Coach Red Blake and the glory years for Army football. Led by Heisman Trophy winners Glenn Davis and Doc Blanchard, the Black Knights were two-time national champions. During their three undefeated seasons of 1944, 45, and 46, the power of Blanchard, Mr. Inside, and the speed of Davis, Mr. Outside, accounted for 10 of Army's 11 touchdowns against Navy. The 1958 game marked the end of Red Blake's 25-year coaching career. Running backs Bob Anderson and Heisman Trophy winner Pete Dawkins would lead the Black Knights to a 20-6 win over Navy, and Army's first undefeated season since 1949. A new decade brought new heroes to the Army-Navy Classic. Only this time, they would wear the blue and gold of Navy. Heisman Trophy winners Joe Bellino and Roger Staubach brought back the winning ways to the Naval Academy. In 1962, in front of 100,000 fans at Municipal Stadium, Philadelphia, Roger Staubach turned in one of the most remarkable performances in the history of the series. He passed for two touchdowns, ran for two more, and was Navy's leading rusher, all against Army. I've never had this, a high after any game ever uh, than I did after that Army-Navy game. I remember in Philadelphia, it was late, we went out uh, after we had a party, and then I had my present wife, who was my girlfriend then, uh, and we kind of walked around and got something to eat even later. Later that night, I saw the Philadelphia papers, and I was there on the front pages of the papers. And it was really a high that I, probably the closest I came to that was we won our first Super Bowl in Dallas. Uh, that night in Philadelphia after we beat Army, which was just a great moment in my life. Tradition. Glory. Honor. Each fall, servicemen throughout the world will tune in to watch the middies square off against the Black Knights. No outcome will be more passionately anticipated, no battle more fiercely waged. But as the final seconds tick, none will forget that they were a part of a much higher calling. Members of the same profession, defenders of the same nation. I truly uh, love Stanford people. I think uh, they have a great purpose in life uh, uh, to exist so that the Bears can beat them uh, in, a, in an athletic contest. It's not your arm or your leg or your life or your wife or anything like that. It's much more important. There are a lot of rivalries, but there's nothing to match the big game. 93rd big game, the snap, the kick is long enough, it looks good, it is! The rivalry between Stanford and Cal dates back over 100 years. 
These two teams first played one another in 1892. Cal issued a challenge to Stanford to play a friendly game of football. But when it came time to play, neither team had brought a ball. Some thought it was the fault of Stanford team manager and future president, Herbert Hoover. Others put the blame on Cal. Whatever the case, someone finally found a football and Stanford had won a hard-fought battle, coming out on top 14 to 10, and the first big game was in the record books. Early on, a tradition was established between these two teams that symbolized the rivalry, the exchanging of the axe. It is a trophy that goes to the winner of the big game. Throughout the years, the axe has become the holy grail of Bay Area football. Through the ages, a number of legends have played and coached in this fierce rivalry. For Cal, Paul Larson, quarterback Vince Ferragamo, Russell White, and coach Joe Cap. For Stanford, Frankie Albert, Jim Plunkett, John Elway, and coach Bill Walsh. This fierce rivalry has produced 45 big games decided by one touchdown or less. In 1924, Glenn Pop Warner took over the Stanford football program. His team, led by All-American Ernie Nevers, was undefeated going into the big game against Cal. The winner would win a trip to the Rose Bowl. Because of what was considered a tougher schedule, the odds makers picked Cal to win both the game and the conference championship. But this was the big game, and anything could happen. It was a seesaw battle, but Stanford put together an incredible rally, tying the undefeated Andy Smith Wonder Team 20 to 20, and Pop had his first trip to Pasadena. The 1953 big game is considered one of the most exciting of all time. It was an offensive display from the opening snap. Larson takes the ball this time, rolls out to his left, hands the ball to White. White gets away from the Stanford tackler, crosses the 10, the 5, and drives into the end zone for a California score. Late in the game, the score was tied at 21. Cal had the ball on the Stanford 8-yard line with just seconds to go. The ball is snapped. It's placed down. The kick is in the air. But the field goal attempt is not good. And a few moments later, the game ended with our final scoreboard reading Stanford 21, California 21. Cal had one of the most feared offenses in the country going into the 1974 big game. Led by quarterback Steve Bartkowski, the Bears scored in the final minutes to pull out a 20-19 victory, or so they thought. Stanford drove the ball to the Cal 33-yard line with two seconds left. They brought out Mike Langford to kick what had to be a 50-yard field goal, and uh, of course the Cal kids thought the game was over and uh, there was no way this uh, Mike was going to kick that field goal. But as history records, he did. 50-yard field goal, won it for Stanford, and I can still see then the Stanford fans uh, rushing out of, the, uh, out of their seats, running down the field, and all the Cal rooters started going back up into the stands and get out of their way. It was quite a scene, and that to me was uh, actually the most exciting big game that I broadcast. It was a crisp and clear afternoon, November 20th, 1982, as Stanford meets Cal for the 85th annual big game. So it's only natural that John Elway and Stanford trail 19 to 17 with only a minute to play. Faced with a desperate fourth and 17 situation, Elway goes back to pass for what could be the last play of his college career. Throws for Harry, it's complete, hold everything. Elway's remarkable pass keeps the drive alive, putting Stanford in a position to win the game. With four seconds to play, kicker Mark Harmon lines up for a potential game-winning 35-yard field goal. It is good! Look out! The Stanford players, fans, and band erupt. The Cardinal have pulled off an amazing comeback. All they have to do is squib kick the ball and run out the remaining four seconds. But then again, this is the big game where anything is possible. You know, the odds of something happening with four seconds left on a kickoff, especially the kind of kickoff they were attempting to do, which is just a squib kick, uh, the odds weren't that good. I just went straight on the field and lined up in my position, and I noticed that we were missing a guy, so I just moved over, and uh, when he kicked it, it happened to just come right to me. 
Cal announcer Joe Starkey calls the game's final play. Rodgers along the sideline, another one. They're still in deep trouble at midfield. They tried to do a couple of... The ball is still loose as they get it to Rodgers. They give it back now to the 30. They're down to the 20. Oh, the band is out on the field. He's going to go into the end zone. He's going into the end zone. Will it count? Everybody's milling around on the field. Now the Bears! The Bears have won! The Bears have won! Oh my God! The most amazing, sensational, dramatic, heart-rending, exciting, thrilling finish in the history of college football. California has won the big game over Stanford. Oh, excuse me for my voice, but I have never, never seen anything like it. For California, for California through. It's called The Game, Harvard versus Yale, one of college football's oldest and most colorful rivalries. The first time these two Ivy League schools played each other, Ulysses S. Grant was president. For the past century and a half, the Eli and Crimson have engaged in spirited battle. Not so much as national football powers, but as prominent universities carrying on the tradition both on and off the field. The most memorable game between these two schools occurred on November 23, 1968. Both teams are undefeated at 8-0 and are playing for the Ivy League title. Yale was supposed to win, and in the fourth quarter, when the game was 29-13 Yale, all the Yale alumni were starting to celebrate. Yale alumni celebrate not with beer, but with champagne. That's the difference between the Big Ten and the Ivy League, but that's another story. So here it is in the fourth quarter, 29 to 13, virtually impossible for Yale to lose or even tie this game. Announcer Don Gillis takes us back to the final 73 seconds. Campy, back to throw, looks for the corner, and it is to Bruce Freeman, touchdown! A two-point conversion cuts the lead to eight with 42 seconds to play. Onside kick, who's going to get it? Scramble, loose ball, Harvard! Harvard has it! Back, Gus Grimm up the middle, Grimm to the 10, Grimm to the 6-yard line, and timeout called by Harvard with 14 seconds on the clock. Can they score? Frank Champy coming up. A hush, he looks, he's got time. He wants to throw. He's still back. Time has run out. He throws. Touchdown! Dick Gallo! Dick Gallo! And the score is 29-27. Champy. He's got it! He's got it! Safari! And it ends 29-29! What a finish! The next day, the headline of the Harvard Crimson read, Harvard Beats Yale, 29-29. Outland Trophy winners. Blocking for Heisman Trophy winners being tackled by Butkus Award winners. Each year, the postseason All-Star Games get an early kickoff when the Sooners and Huskers get together. More All-Americans clash helmets in this game than in any other rivalry in America, a rivalry which always produces the hardest-hitting game of the year.
Oklahoma and Nebraska, the road to the national championship leads through Miami and the Orange Bowl. And there's no getting to the Orange Bowl without first taking care of a little business in either Norman or Lincoln. I know what it means to every senior in this room. I know what it means to everybody else. So we got to go out and play our game and make them hurt. This game today is the two best teams in the country, without a question. Millions of people think that. Millions of people believe these two teams can beat Penn State and whoever they play. So this game is for the national championship today. The national title has been riding on this game on many occasions. The most memorable, Thanksgiving Day, 1971. Bob Devaney's number one ranked 10-0 Nebraska Cornhuskers travel to Norman to take on Chuck Fairbanks' number two ranked undefeated Sooners in the season finale. At stake, the Big 8 title, a shot at the national championship, and a 30-game winning streak for the Huskers. The game starts off with a bang as Johnny Rogers takes an Oklahoma punt at his own 28 and stuns the partisan Sooner crowd with an electrifying 72-yard touchdown run. Oklahoma comes back as quarterback Jack Mildren spots John Harrison for a touchdown as the Sooners go up on top 17-14. This is the first time the Huskers are trailing at halftime all season long. Nebraska's fullback Jeff Kinney is close to unstoppable in the second half as the Cornhuskers roar back to take the lead 28-17. Faced with a fourth and six situation with seven minutes to go, Oklahoma quarterback Jack Mildren goes to the air as the Sooners regain the lead, 31-28. Amazingly, it's the third lead change of the day. With the national title on the line, the Cornhuskers start what some writers call the gutsiest drive in college football history. Of the 12 plays, Jeff Kinney carries the ball seven times. His final run is a two-yard touchdown, his fourth of the day, giving Nebraska a dramatic 35-31 victory. When the dust settled, these two rivals gained 829 yards and scored nine touchdowns. It is considered by many as the greatest college football game ever played. College football is full of colorful rivalries, Here's a look at some more memorable matchups, starting with USC versus UCLA. Of all the bitter rivalries in college sports, this is one of the most bitter. They're in the same city. They compete for the same athletes. They compete for the same entertainment dollar. They compete for space in the newspapers. They compete for time on the 11 o'clock news. And they competed for the national title on that November afternoon in 1967 in one of the great stadiums in America. Sure, it's old, but it has character. The Los Angeles Coliseum. You had the UCLA cheerleaders. You had the USC cheerleaders. You had that crazy horse. And you had quarterback Gary Beban for UCLA. And you had O.J. Simpson for the USC Trojans. Beban won the Heisman Trophy, but Simpson won the national title. He won it in the fourth quarter with a 64-yard run and USC won 21 to 20. Yes, it's one of the great rivalries in college football, and it should remain that way for eternity. Welcome, all you fans, for the Texas OU game. The Cotton Bowl in Dallas, Texas is home each year for the battle between Texas and Oklahoma. And you know you're going into battle, and you know you're going into battle with 120 guys and, and the coaching staff and, and all the fans. It's either orange and white on one side or red and white on the other. It's no in-between. This rivalry has featured some coaching legends, Oklahoma's Bud Wilkinson, Texas's Darrell Royal, and Sooner coach Barry Switzer. It doesn't matter who coaches in this huge rivalry, one thing's for certain. Sooner and Longhorn fans will bet a great deal of oil and land on the game's winner. A winner who will carry bragging rights for an entire year. Until these two teams square off once again in Dallas to continue one of college football's most intense state line rivalry. Rabbit, jabber, yeller, hammer, give them hell, Alabama! Row! Body, get a body, get a body, get a body!
Welcome to the Alabama-Auburn rivalry. For Auburn fans, beating Bama is a year-round preoccupation. It is a 365-day obsession for the rest of their lives. That gives you some sense of what it's like. Tradition runs deep at Alabama, especially with their legendary coach, Bear Bryant, who earned his record-breaking 315th victory in 1971 by defeating, who else? Auburn. Alabama and Auburn could play on the moon, but the passion would be there 365 days a year. Florida, Georgia. Somebody once called it the world's largest outdoor cocktail party. Certainly is that, and one of the great scenes in college football. The most memorable game occurred in 1980 as Georgia scored with seconds remaining to defeat the Gators and go on to the national title. In football craze Pennsylvania, there's no bigger show than Pitt and Penn State. The Golden Panthers and the Nittany Lions have torn it up for over 100 years. It's intercepted. Here comes a man with a football. He's got nothing but sideline. Billy Owens, he's got the ball held with one hand in the air as he takes it all the way for the Panther touchdown. Pitt Stadium has gone berserk. When we were playing Pitt when the rivalry was very intense. Why it would, that week was something special and you get a lot of letters, you get people send you clippings and people would call up and say, hey, you got to beat Pitt this week, you know, don't let us down. The outside, 20, 15, Dozier, 10, 5, touchdown Penn State. They're the kind of games that I enjoyed playing and what kept me interested in college football. I think they they brought out the best in, in, in us as coaches, best as players. And I think when all was said and done, they brought out the best in our fans because, you know, they, there was a lot of talk going up to the game. There was a lot of people shooting their mouths off. But when the game was over, there was a genuine respect for the other guy. Some of the great rivalries in college football are between schools which aren't powerhouses. Schools which play with the passion and the dedication at the players who play in Michigan, Ohio State, USC, UCLA, or Texas, Oklahoma. One of these games is Lehigh at Lafayette. These two schools have played each other more than any other two schools in all of college football. They're located not too far from each other in the eastern part of Pennsylvania. Lehigh in Bethlehem and Lafayette and Eastern. And when they play, it's quite a game. And if you haven't seen a game between Lafayette and Lehigh, some Saturday afternoon, they usually play the Saturday before Thanksgiving. Take a trip to either Bethlehem or Eastern and watch the Leopards play, the Engineers. You will enjoy yourself. And that wraps it up for college football's all-time rivalries. I'm Charlie Steiner. We'll see you next time.